Hello folks, uh, this is Rodrigo Worley and I'm an assistant professor and extension weed scientist in the Department of Agronomy at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And I'm here today recording this presentation on October 30th, uh, 2020 uh, to give you all an update on water hemp herbicide resistance and water hemp management considerations in soybeans in 2021. If you're interested in our research, I invite you to visit our website www.wiskweeds.info or if you have a smartphone on you, you can simply take a picture of the QR code on the bottom right side of the slide and that will take you to our website. Before I start, I would like to acknowledge our research team uh, for their hard work and dedication and also uh, our sponsors including the Wisconsin Soybean Marketing Board, the Wisconsin Corn Promotion Board, and uh, the United Soybean Board. So to set the stage, I would like to talk about research being conducted by the graduate student uh, Felipe Faleco. So we have been working with more than 80 populations that we received from stakeholders uh, from around the state in the fall of 2018. So Felipe has been screening those populations for resistance to multiple herbicides and today I'm going to focus on the results from his glyphosate and imazepapir uh, screenings. So what he does uh, in these screenings, he grows uh, the plants and when they're about three to four inches in height, he sprays them with a one or a three x rate of the product of interest. So for glyphosate, the 1x rate that we used in this study was 22 fluid ounces of Roundup Power Max. And for imazepapir, which is a group 2 herbicide or an ALS inhibitor herbicide, uh, we used Pursuit at 4 fluid ounces. So according to Felipe results, 95% um, of the populations that he screened, and he screened 86 populations total from Wisconsin, 95% of them were confirmed resistant to glyphosate and 96% of them were confirmed resistant to ALS herbicides. Uh, here in, we can conclude that resistance to glyphosate and ALS herbicides is widespread in Wisconsin water hemp populations. Here I have a map uh, showcasing the counties where glyphosate resistance has been reported. So the counties in red is where we have uh, confirmed the presence of glyphosate resistant water hemp. So if your county here is in white, uh, that does not mean resistance is not present. It just means that we haven't confirmed it yet. And then the second figure here uh, represents the counties with resistance to PPO inhibitor herbicides. Okay, so right now uh, we have 29 counties with confirmed glyphosate resistance and currently we have 22 counties uh, with PPO resistance. So why does that matter? Well, most of our farmers, they grow Roundup Ready uh, soybeans. So the main post-emergent options are glyphosate, ALS herbicides, or PPO herbicides. And as I just showed here uh, some data, uh, several of these water hemp populations are resistant to the three herbicide sites of action, leaving growers with very, very limited options for effective uh, water hemp control post-emergence. This is what we're seeing evolving in this past years. Uh, we have the new traits uh, coming into the marketplace and in the fall and the winter time is the time that the producers are selecting their varieties. Therefore, we urge our growers to pay co close attention to the novel herbicide tolerance traits that are available uh, to properly select them uh, and have uh, you know, access to effective options from a post-emergence weed control perspective. For instance, the Extend platform brings tolerance to dicamba into the marketplace. The Enlist platform uh, confers tolerance to 2,4-D and glufosinate. Uh, the LLGT27 is also tolerant to glufosinate. And more recently, the Extend Flag soybeans confers tolerance to dicamba uh, and glufosinate. So pretty much our growers are left uh, with deciding between a glufosinate, 2,4-D, and or dicamba uh, product, which has implications that I'm going to discuss later on. So going into the 2021 growing season, uh, if you're a farmer uh, that is struggling uh, with 
water hemp resistant to PPO, ALS, herbicides, and glyphosate. Uh, this is our current recommendation, and I'm going to be focusing primarily on the uh, chemistry uh, aspect of weed control. So the recommendation is to start clean. Uh, so early in the growing season, uh, before planting, uh, if you're in a tillage, uh, system you can cultivate the ground and eliminate established plants if you're in a no-till scenario you're going to need some burn down chemistry at that point when you're planting when you're about to plant or when you have just planted it is recommended that you spray a pre-emergent herbicide uh, with multiple active ingredients okay and targeting water hemp here what we've learned from our research is that a combination of a group 14 herbicide including a valor uh, or a spartan based uh, product tank mixed uh, with a group 2 herbicide for instance either first rate, first rate uh, classic or pursuit or alternatively to group 2 a group 15 so you could potentially tank mix or have a premix that contains a warrant based outlook um, zedra or a dual type product in there uh, that tends to perform extremely well and then what re recent research has indicated is that if PPO resistance is present, uh, the addition of metribuzin, uh, it's also beneficial from a water hemp control standpoint. So again, you're going to pick a group 14 herbicide plus a group 2 or 15, and then depending on the resistance and the severity of the water hemp infestation, looking into adding metribuzin into the tank mix can be beneficial. So this is your pre-emergent herbicide program. Weed control from that program is going to last three, four, five weeks, depending on the year, depending on the rates, depending on the soil type, uh, depending on the amount of rainfall, weather conditions, and so on. So we urge our farmers uh, to start scouting at about three to four weeks after that application. Okay, uh, And as soon as the water hemp starts breaking through the residual program, that's when you want to trigger a post-emergence uh, application. And from our research, we've learned that when the beans are at the V3, V4 stage, that is the ideal time uh, to be spraying the post-emergence herbicide program. At that time of post-emergence application, the farmers want to make sure they use, they have access, they can use one effective active ingredient. So you want to make sure that the uh, at least one of the active ingredients post-emergence is effective on water ham. For instance, if you're spraying glyphosate and if you have glyphosate resistance, glyphosate in that scenario is not counted as an effective active ingredient. Uh, so if you have, for instance, glyphosate resistance, ALS resistance, MPPO resistance, you're left to use uh, one of the herbicides that's associated to the novel traits, whether that's going to be glufosinate, uh, the 2,4-D or dicamba that's up to you, to the decisions you make in terms of uh, trait selection. One of the recommendations as well at the time of that post application is to consider uh, adding a group 15 herbicide into that tank mix, okay, whether that's going to be Warrant, Outlook, Zedra, or Duo. Uh, that's going to depend on the farmer's preference, but it's recommended that one of those products is added with the post-emergence application to bring additional residual activity in season. Okay, so what that does, you control weeds that are established, you bring additional residual activity uh, to help suppress the weeds that are yet to emerge until your crop fully closes the canopy. So that's the chemical recommendation uh, uh, for our producers. So from a herbicide tolerance trait standpoint, uh, these are some of the questions that the farmers should be asking themselves right now. You know, of course, you want to pick varieties with good yield potential, uh, with high levels of disease tolerance. You want to make sure the seeds are available. Uh, but you also got to understand the herbicide application requirements, okay? Because the way you spray dicamba is different than the way you spray 2,4-D choline and is different the way that you spray glufosinate. So we urge our farmers to have a good understanding of these different chemistries, how they should be sprayed from an off-target movement standpoint, but also in order to enhance uh, weed control. As indicated, water hemp has been evolving resistance to several herbicides, okay? Uh, so we have lost a, a lot of tools. So fighting resistance with herbicides only won't last. So one thing I urge our farmers is to start thinking outside of the jug. So every time they're deciding their weed control program, uh, what I've been asking them to do is to also try to think and hopefully implement two additional non-chemical weed control strategies into their uh, weed control program. And I'm going to quickly show three examples here of strategies, non-chemical control strategies that can be integrated uh, into their weed control program. 
First, uh, combines. Combines do a tremendous job with spreading weed seeds from fields to fields. Nick Arniston led a project and alongside with Dan Smith in the NPM program. They invited stakeholders to submit samples uh, collected from foreign material in the front part of the combine. Nick grew the samples in the greenhouse and he found that 97% of them contained viable weed seed. Half of them contained pigweed seeds. Okay, so our message here to our growers is they harvest, you know, always start from the weed free fields and then harvest the weed infested fields last and clean that combine in between fields as often as possible to stop and prevent the spread of resistant weed seeds. Another integrated weed management strategy or non-chemical strategy here that can be brought into the portfolio, uh, it's high biomass cover crop system. So here, oh, we conduct our research, we harvest the corn in the fall, we plant cereal rye, and then in the spring, we wait for that rye uh, to reach antheses, and then we come and we plant our soybeans green. And at that time, what we're investigating, when you plant your soybeans, uh, you come and you terminate uh, with glyphosate. Glyphosate tends to be very effective at terminating cereal rye. And in the tank mix, you have your effective pre-emergence herbicide program. So we have seen some excellent results in terms of weed control in that system. Uh, and we have not seen a new reduction from soybeans uh, in terms when you compare this system to a no-till or a tillage scenario. Another uh, integrated strategy or a non-chemical strategy that could be considered is row spacing. So these are mid-May soybeans. Okay, and this picture was taken on July 2nd, so 45 days after planting, 30 inch row spacing. And then on the right here, I have 15 inch row spacing planted on the same day, same seeding rate. Look at the difference there. So if you were a weed, where would you rather be? Uh, what we've learned over this past three years uh, working with Waterhamp in our research trials around Wisconsin is that the greater the level of control you achieve from your pre-emergence herbicide program, the more successful you are in controlling water hemp post-emergence as well and having uh, good end of season water hemp control. Okay, so the pre-emergence herbicide program represents the foundation and you got to have a strong foundation in order to have a successful weed control season, regardless of the trait, whether it's going to be your enlist, your extend, extend flax or your LGT27 soybeans. An effective two-pass layered residual approach uh, performed extremely well uh, during 2018 and 2019 for us. That program didn't perform quite well uh, in 2020, and that's because our soybeans were planted really early in 2020. So we had good conditions late April. The beans went in. I mean, we planted most of our trials two or three weeks uh, ahead as compared to the 2019 growing season. So the sooner you plant, the sooner you're spraying your pre-herbicides, you know, the residual activity tend not to last as long. And in 2020 was one of those years where the third pass uh, was necessary in our research trials for that complete control. So that's something that farmers must also uh, keep in mind. And then lastly, I invite our growers, every time they're deciding their herbicide program, to also consider two additional non-chemical weed control strategies. Uh, that way, uh, we can hopefully be more successful controlling these weeds long term. So with that, I, hear, I leave here my contact information if you have questions. Thank you.